And just briefly about myself, because I've been speaking, uh, uh, I've been uh, introducing other speakers, but uh, I realize now I haven't introduced actually myself. So um, I am uh, in my final year of doctoral studies here at the University of Oxford I, uh, in interdisciplinary bioscience, which is uh, a less complicated name for a mixture between vaccine development, uh, bioinformatics, uh, comparative immunology and what I do on the side, uh, just of, out of pure passion, uh, public health. Uh, and my presentation today will focus exactly on uh, the activities which uh, I've done in Romania, but um, not just my activities, but also an or overview of, the, of what exactly uh, unfolded in Romania from the perspective of religious community engagement for public health. And for my presentation, I will actually focus mostly on the Romanian Orthodox Church, uh, and you'll see quite soon why, because it is, first and foremost, it is the majoritarian church in the country with close to 85%, so between 80 to 85% of Romanians adhering to the Romanian Orthodox Church. Um, so, just as a um, bit of background, so Romania has a population of 19 million, according to recent estimates, and a very large uh, population outside of its borders, so close to four or five million people, depending on the estimates. Uh, so quite a lot of Romanians are uh, outside of the current borders of Romania. Uh, and sadly, in the European Union, Romania has the lowest GDP expenditure per capita uh, for healthcare, the highest percentage of treatable causes of mortality, and one of the lowest vaccination coverages for um, vaccine preventable diseases, uh, basically the childhood diseases such as measles and the rest. Um, these Unfortunate features of the Romanian healthcare system and the, the healthcare situation in general in Romania obviously did not offer us a good starting point when the pandemic unfolded within our country. Um, and because of the large population uh, living outside of the borders, many of the people, because of the uncertainties during uh, the early stages of the pandemic, be because of the national lockdowns and the panic that was because of the disease. Basically, all of them packed up their bags and decided to go home. A lot of them may be seasonal workers, a lot of them um, even having residence in the countries, but still having relatives and family and uh, properties, let's say, in Romania. So they all rushed back in, during the early stages of the pandemic. And obviously, that imposed a major um, problem, not just logistically, but a major problem healthcare-wise, because uh, many of those people were actually returning um, from um, highly affected regions, including the northern part of Italy, and presentations beforehand mentioned how uh, affected that region was at the beginning of the pandemic. So, um, because of this massive influx of expats at the beginning of the pandemic, um, we were actually very fortunate in the sense that the public health authorities in our country were able to implement some very strict measures um, at the early stages of the pandemic, which likely avoided a public health disaster in this, these terms, because all the citizens that were returning from abroad were required to, to quarantine and self-isolate to sign a, um, uh, an entry form in the country specifying where they would have um, isolated and so on. Um, and needless to say, these um, setting aside how, um, how those measures were implemented and their um, ultimate effect and goal, what is certain that can be said about them is that they caused a major unrest amongst those people that were returning because um, not only did we not know anything about COVID at the time, and, but people were also asked to uh, abide by very strict measures and also trust the government and the authorities. Um, so, as I said, this social unrest coupled with the spread of fake news, which I think was a, an overarching th theme today, 
manage to um, embed extra fear in the minds of people when they were returning in our country. Um, and in order to address this problem, basically, and the way Romania was, uh, was able to overcome this major problem at the beginning of the pandemic was through effective communication. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about that um, in the sense, but first I, I would like to separate the classical methods of communication uh, from the non-classical ones in a very, um, I would say, convenient separation, but will be useful for the discussion, for the presentation uh, following this. So the classical methods, we all know them. I mean, we've seen COVID uh, uh, announcements on television, you know, wear your mask, go get vaccinated, whatever, on the radio as well, guidance from the experts, from the government, et cetera, et cetera. But there are also non-classical methods. And the non-classical methods involve the extra bit that society can do in order to get the message across. And this can be the involvement of highly influential public figures. Of course, you, we know plenty of examples, you know, when we had actors or uh, sports persons that were actively involved in promoting a healthcare message, uh, but also religious institutions and uh, faith-based community leaders. And this is a resource that is especially relevant when you are referring to one of the most religious countries in Europe. Actually, according to this statistic, Romania is the most religious country in Europe, uh, with about 50% of people saying that religion is an important part of their lives. Uh, again, 50% say that they attend worship um, at least monthly. 44% say that they pray daily. And... 64% uh, say that they believe in God with absol uh, absolute certainty. Um, and according to an index compiled, uh, compiled by the Pew Research Organization, 55% um, of Romanians are highly religious. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentations, uh, more than 80% of uh, Romania's population um, religiously adheres to the Romanian Orthodox Church. Um, so just a very shallow background on the Eastern Orthodox Church in general. Uh, so it's the second largest Christian church in the world with around 220 million members worldwide. And it's comprised of several regional churches, including Bulgaria, Greece, the Church of Romania, so the Romanian Orthodox Church, Russia, Serbia, and some others. Um, but... Um, like other churches as well, the religious responses in the Orthodox Church were quite mixed, and especially at the beginning of the pandemic and later on when vaccines um, came on the market and uh, the public vaccination campaigns began. I will discuss those things in a minute, um, but first I would like to show you some of these mixed responses that were witnessed in the Eastern Orthodox Church. And you can see um, headlines collected throughout the pandemic on uh, people crowding for epiphany in Romania and Bulgaria, defying the healthcare regulations at the time imposed by the governments. Um, again, in Greece, the same thing happening, defying the lockdown order. Um, in Kiev and in many other places in Orthodox Christianity, monasteries having a more secluded life and an intimate association between the, the clergy serving at those monasteries led to those monasteries actually becoming hotspots of infection and sadly many of the monks, especially the elderly ones, succumbed to the illness and sadly died. Um, and perhaps the most dramatic uh, scenario that unfolded uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic was when the, our, uh, the Bishop of Montenegro uh, openly uh, against the COVID-19 um, uh, measures at the time officiated services without public health, uh, any, uh, any protective measures, and sadly became infected and died. But the story sadly and tragically does not end there because the Serbian patriarch, Patriarch Irine, officiated his funeral ceremony where again public health regulations were not respected and people obviously uh, mourning for, for the loss of the, the bishop were um, uh, crowding and obviously that served for a mechanism of spread and the patriarch himself caught the disease and later on succumbed to the illness and died. Um, and we can 
enumerate a lot of these situations happening, not just in the Orthodox Church, in other churches as well. Uh, and in Romania, we had our own version of this dramatic scenario unfolding with the oldest member of the Holy Synod of the Church, uh, Archbishop Piman, who's actually from the region of Romania where I'm from, so a highly beloved Archbishop of the Romanian Orthodox Church. Um, some say that it is how uh, he caught COVID also because he didn't officiate the, the services using the appropriate protective measures, although uh, it's hard to pinpoint exactly, but there have been vi leaked videos of him officiating service without social distancing and wearing masks and whatnot. Uh, so sadly, he became infected, developed serious symptoms, and tragically died uh, of COVID um, a few weeks later. Um, so setting these examples aside, uh, just to illustrate how uh, the positive aspect as well, um, but also to give some contrasts about when and how public health measures and cooperations with the state authorities, and not only with the experts in the field, could have improved the situation and likely have, uh, likely have avoided such tragedies. Um, so, going back to the Romanian Orthodox Church in general, it is the most, relig uh, is the most influential religious institution in Romania, um, as I said before. Uh, not only that, but according to national surveys, people place their trust uh, levels, uh, place the Orthodox Church the second highest in trust after the, the military of the country. And not only that, but like other uh, large churches, it possesses quite a wide network of media uh, channels, including television, press, um, radio, and so on. Um, and as I mentioned before, some unfortunate events occurred, but I will like now to focus on the context, and the context is one of the lack of communication. Um, and one of the most dramatic ones, and it was mentioned before by Mr. Rayu, is the Holy Communion uh, scenario, which in Orthodox Christianity, um, it's... Um, Happens like in other, other uh, Christian religions as well, but there's the sacred cup and the spoon, um, which are liturgical objects, so sacred objects, uh, and the way it happens during service, um, for those that are unfamiliarized with this, is that um, the priest distributes uh, the body and blood of Christ, the bread and the wine, which after the, the liturgy become uh, um, the body and bl blood of Christ and um, distribute them sequentially to believers. Um, and from a public health point of view, this is a bit of a risk. And luck, uh, indeed so, because uh, even though there aren't any um, studies that have assessed this, and also for the sensitivities behind assessing such a thing, you get... It's, it would be highly inappropriate to conduct a clinical trial of how many people would get infected after communion. But the possibility, even though the chances would be reduced, the possibility of spread is still there. So the recommendation from the public health authorities at the time came that the traditional method of administering communion should be replaced with plastic, uh, plasticware. And even though it might seem like a sensible solution, um, this recommendation came more as an imperative, as a directive from the state to, um, um, to all the churches to renounce the, basically the holiest act of the church, to renounce it and substitute it with plasticware. Uh, and this did not end up very well because it resulted in a major backlash, which was interpreted by most people, including clergy, as a violation of religious freedom. And um, just to sum it up, actually, uh, the consequences of this inappropriate communication ended up with people becoming even more polarized and more negative sentiments towards the state authorities if they didn't 
if they wouldn't have asked for anything because the measure was never implemented. This never stopped. What the recommendation itself was able to do is just polarize people more and make them uh, distrust the state authorities and implicitly the public health measures um, that were implemented throughout the COVID-19 um, pandemic in Romania. Um, another aspect in, uh, I want to discuss is pilgrimages, but now I'll um, uh, present uh, contrast as well because different scenarios happened when uh, uh, the context changed and I'll go come back to that in a minute. So pilgrimages, as you may know, are major, major religious events with depending on the location and the shrine that is visited by the pilgrimages in different faiths can attract thousands, hundreds of thousands, even millions of people uh, over a relatively short time period. And in Romania, a major pilgrimage site is Yash, where the relics of uh, St. Paraskeva are housed. And this pilgrimage attracts around 80,000 to some uh, close to 100,000 people over the course of a few days um, in some years, in most years. And obviously this, um, this influx of pilgrims represents a major risk for COVID-19 transmission and for the transmission of any respiratory disease. Um, so again, the authorities thought that a good measure to limit the spread of the disease would be to only allow the people that are residents uh, of Yash, of that city, uh, that only have their national ID card, um, specifying Yash as a hometown, to go to the shrine and worship the saint. And this did not go well. All right, so this happened in 2020, and if what you can see there on the screen, this large gathering of people that was protesting outside of the cathedral in Yash was eventually let in by the authorities because they couldn't handle uh, the pressure and the risk of riots and protests and, and violence there. So basically, everything that was initially intended to contain the spread of the disease actually facilitated transmission because all of those people, instead of going sequentially, one at a time, in a controlled manner, they all went in together. It was um, basically, um, this happened here, as you can see, despite the efforts of those priests there, they are trying to wipe the the holy relics with some disinfectant and the uh, the wearing of masks. The the um, the density of the population has likely contributed uh, to cases of COVID nineteen spread. Um, so up until now, I've had negative examples of what happened, and as I mentioned before, it's mostly attributable to a lack of communication. But I would like to talk a bit about what happened when communication was present. Because when active dialogue between public health specialists, between health authorities and representatives of the church was initiated, we were able to have successful results. And going back to the pilgrimage of 2020 at St. Paraskeva, what happened in 2021 was basically the authorities acknowledging their mistake in the previous year and allowing um, the church after consultations and dialogue to organize the pilgrimage according to public health measures. Um, so the church was basically now allowed to do the pilgrimage with the aid and the, uh, by consulting authorities and respecting public health measures. And the difference between 2020, I believe, and 2021 is quite a clear one. Um, and I would say this is a major success um, because, fair enough, it is not a total... Um, we do not eliminate the risk. We do not eliminate it, but we definitely minimize it in the sense of a normal compromise that can be achieved for the benefit of the society. Um, another example which I will present is what happened during the 2020 Easter period. Uh, so 
Easter is a major Christian holiday, and um, the way it happens in the Orthodox Church is that uh, believers gather at the evening service uh, to get the holy light. Um, and obviously, again, it's a mass gathering event which imposes risk like any religious gathering, but this one in particular because uh, it's, uh, it has a higher church attendance than most church services. Um, so the decision was to allow the church to proceed with this, but under controlled settings. So church or NGOs, organizations of, directly of the church um, and the public health authorities contributed to a rather weird um, progress of this event in 2020, um, which you can see here, it's a bit strange, a bit post-apocalyptic, but now we, we've all been through that, where uh, it no longer surprises us. Um, so you can see here volunteers uh, at a church uh, and another volunteer here uh, likely giving, uh, distributing the holy light to an elderly lady there that at the time with no vaccines available um, and obviously due to the, incre uh, to the increased um, age of the person would have been at high risk of uh, severe forms of the disease. Um, and although no appropriate quantitative methods to assess the, the effects of the Orthodox 2020 Easter in Romania were there, if you look at this graph here, the Orthodox Easter falls I um, believe it was the 18th of April or 19th of April, I think, in 2020. Um, and you can see here the following two weeks or so did not lead to a major increase in cases overall in the country, although this is not, I would say, a truly appropriate epidemiologist here in the room might, um, might twitch a bit when uh, I would say that this was a success, but what can be said is that it definitely did not contribute in a, in a measurable way to the pandemic in Romania after, um, after it was officiated. Um, and this, again, going back to that, was achieved through dialogue, through understanding, through communication, and which together were able to prevent social unrest and uh, um, this brings me basically to the message uh, that I believe it's, it's an overarching one for the entire conference and for the other presentations as well. Um, and you can see here, here illustrated the pa Palace of Parliament uh, of Romania and uh, the cathedral in Bucharest, uh, which I chose conveniently to symbolize the religious institution and the state authority on the uh, on the other hand, so what usually happens in terms of public health measures and policy in general is that governmental authorities channel a unidirectional message to the religious institutions and sadly the output of that message because it does not deal with the certain sensitivities as I've presented before is likely to be very small. However, if bidirectional consultations occur, if the message goes both, both ways. If continuous dialogue and understanding is promoted, um, thereby acknowledging potential religious implications that might hinder the implementation of those policies, the output might be much, much larger. Um, and this can only be achieved through finding that common ground for the benefit of society. Um, the last thing I would like to talk, uh, touch on about is vaccination and vaccination in Romania, uh, as Nigel mentioned before, it's, uh, it's quite a poor um, um, and also at the beginning of the presentation I did mention that Romania has one of the lowest vaccination coverages for, child, for vaccine preventable diseases. Now vaccination in Romania has been terribly neglected by the state authorities I would say for more than 30 years, because um, there was no major public health campaign targeted on vaccination and the vaccination of children, on increasing the understanding of parents and in, of the general population about the benefits of vaccination. We had an HPV vaccination in Romania a few years back that ended up with a success rate of 0.3, I believe, um, percent, 
So this is, was clearly a major problem. But in the context of the church, so the church, according to a protocol that uh, existed, uh, I'm not sure exactly when it was signed, but the protocol of uh, uh, spiritual and um, physical um, health that was established between the Romanian Orthodox Church and the Ministry of Health specified that the church does officially support vaccinations, obviously if they're not destined for commercial purposes, and if individual rights and freedoms are respected, which is quite sensible. And however, a lot of religious, religiously uh, themed or um, church-connected NGOs um, have over the years, alongside the general anti-vaccine movement in Romania, promoted uh, a lot of misinformation and sadly enough, uh, many clerics, uh, so many members of the church, including some high-ranking figures, uh, openly opposed vaccination and encouraged people not to get their children vaccinated or now during COVID-19 to get themselves vaccinated against the disease. Uh, this is a poster, actually, that um, I have. Um, I have. I, I also have the picture because it was in the, my hometown, um, and this is a conference. Uh, just a translation of it is what you did not know about vaccines: a scientific Orthodox perspective, and amongst other things, the. Uh, one of the, the points there are the uh, adverse effects of vaccines, the uh, myth of um, eliminating epidemics through vaccination or the links of uh, autism and vaccination, all of them being scientifically disproven facts by hundreds, thousands even of studies that were conducted on internationally and by an impartial scientific committee. Um, however, these conferences being open to everybody and being supported by priests or uh, people that are affiliated and uh, connected to, a, to, to the church in a form or another uh, um, contributed to this, um, I would say, perversion of religion and the anti-vaccine movement. Um, and this, of course, was a problem that needed to be addressed way before vaccines against COVID became available because vaccination against COVID uh, was very likely to happen given that we had several candidate vaccines uh, in the summer of 2020 already. So at least one of them would have worked. Uh, what do we do, the question remains, when one of them or all of them or some of them get approved, get their, the license and pass all the clinical trials. Who are we going to vaccinate if people do not want to get vaccinated? Um, so sure enough, the story is a bit more complicated than that, but um, the story with the vaccination uh, and how the vaccination campaign started in Romania was basically that there was a meeting in early December 2020 between state authorities, representatives of the ministries of health and uh, religious uh, representatives and religious leaders, during which um, the topic of vaccination was discussed. And in that meeting, it was decided that informative materials will be circulated to the churches and um, to inform on the practice of vaccination against COVID and not just COVID. And in January, so a bit after uh, the vaccination campaign started in Romania, the vaccination campaign started on the 27th of December, if I'm uh, not wrong. Um, on the 4th of January, this leaflet was sent to the chancellery of the Romanian Orthodox Church. And on the 8th of January, the patriarch himself, uh, his bad to Daniel, circulated it to the members of the clergy in the church. And during this time, indeed, there was a continuous dialogue between church officials, public health experts, and representatives of the state. Um, at the early pandemic, uh, there was even um, a show on the national um, television station of the Romanian Orthodox Church, hosted by Mr. Vasile Bonescu, where I was invited alongside, uh, I would say, an influential member of the clergy, uh, an influential priest that is quite, um, has shows and uh, uh, is quite present in the online, so people know him and about him and follow him uh, on, in the social media. And 
during this, this show, we discussed about vaccination and we addressed exactly the questions, um, the most common questions that would arise um, about vaccines and about why people shouldn't get vaccinated uh, using religious arguments, because many of these uh, arguments against vaccination sadly use religious arguments and take advantage of people's religious sensibilities uh, in order to convince them not to get vaccinated. Um, so just to sum it up, uh, and I'm, I'm actually on time, sort of, um, some unfortunate events did occur, like pilgrimages, like gatherings and so on. But the significant charitable work, which I haven't touched almost at all during, um, during this and will quite likely be explained in more detail in the subsequent presentation of the Romanian Orthodox Church delegation, um, is something tremendous that cannot be neglected. And this applies to religious institutions in general where they have a high and active presence within the communities because the church can offer uh, a lot of support that often exceeds what the state and the national authorities can provide. Um, and I would say that overall, the Romanian Orthodox Church supported the public health measures when efficient dialogue was initiated. And my impression is from the talks today um, is that this is a general um, and a recurring theme because when state authorities and public health authorities or policy makers in general want their policies to be implemented in the context of religious communities and it's often quite hard to avoid for them not to influence in a certain degree or another religious communities um, the best way through to do it is through dialogue through understanding and indeed through compromises which can result in a much much better um, result overall uh, of the policies that are being implemented and this is particularly relevant in the public health context. Um, so in the future directions, of course, it would be very useful to extend these dialogues with other churches in Romania um, to consolidate the current, uh, the current channels of communications that have already been formed, not only with the Romanian Orthodox Church, but also with other religious institutions in Romania, uh, and to extend these dialogues to include other topics like medical screening, uh, blood donations were mentioned before, so um, which was actually a very successful public health campaign of the Romanian Orthodox Church. Uh, childhood vaccinations, because again, um, last year I believe, or if, um, poliomyelitis became also something that is on the radar. Fortunately for us, we still haven't had any cases in Romania, but the issue still remains, and especially in the current refugee crisis situation that we are facing with the Russian invasion of Ukraine. So I believe I've done this later part, or at least I hope you will agree uh, to it, um, that it is only through communicating the lessons learned from these case studies that we can better our practices in the future and have better results for the betterment of public health of our communities. So thank you for your time and attention, and uh, I'm happy to take any questions.